refinery. The drone attack setting off these raging fires in Saudi Arabia, increasing tensions in the Middle East and threatening supplies. What it could mean for the price of oil now and the winter to come. Breaking overnight, deck collapse on the Jersey Shore. Nearly two dozen people sent to the hospital. The three levels pancaking, trapping people underneath the debris. Why first responders happened to be right there when disaster struck. Hot on camera, barrage of bullets. Police gunfire so intense, it drowns out their sirens. More than a dozen officers involved as they set their sights on a suspect. An investigation underway into this massive police response. Get off the geyser. The tourists caught on camera getting way too close to Old Faithful, coming dangerously close to its hot steam. It's not the first time this has happened. The charges they're facing this morning. And pardon the pun, but it's an adorable moment. The doorbell cam capturing a young boy's pledge. The ugly events that led to this sweet moment. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. I love that story. Yeah, love that so story. Patriotic young fellow. <laughs> yes, we'll get to that coming up. We're going to start here with a developing story that has serious implications both for our national security and for the price of your next trip to the gas station, perhaps. This morning, Iranian officials are denying that they're behind a series of brazen drone attacks against a pair of giant oil facilities over in Saudi Arabia. Now, these fiery attacks knocked out more than half of Saudi Arabia's oil output, which could well drive up oil prices globally. The attacks already adding tensions between the White House and Iran. Overnight, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo directly accusing Iran of mounting the assault. So does this situation bring America closer to confrontation with Iran? And what are the short-term implications for your wallet? We have team coverage this morning. Steve Ganyard and George Stephanopoulos standing by for analysis. But we begin at the White House with ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Stephanie, good morning. Wait, good morning. Here's the big question this morning. Was Iran behind the attacks on the world's largest oil refinery in Saudi Arabia? President Trump telling Saudi Arabian leaders they have every right to defend themselves. The pressure in the region only intensifying. More than 20 drones attached the world's largest oil processing facility in Saudi Arabia and a major oil field, sparking massive fires. Flames seen here glowing Saturday. The smoke billowing in these satellite images. Houthi rebels in Yemen claiming responsibility for the attack. President Trump calling the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman Saturday to offer his support for Saudi Arabia's self-defense, the White House said in a statement. But while the White House hasn't publicly blamed anyone for the attack on the Saudi oil facilities, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is calling out Iran, tweeting, Tehran is behind nearly 100 attacks on Saudi Arabia. Amid all the calls for de-escalation, Iran has now launched an unprecedented attack on the world's energy supply. There is no evidence the attacks came from Yemen. We call on all nations to publicly and unequivocally condemn Iran's attacks. The effect of these latest attacks already rippling through Saudi Arabia. Saudi Aramco, the state-owned oil giant, says these latest attacks resulted in production suspension of 5.7 million barrels of crude oil per day, roughly 5% of global oil production. The disruption could mean a spike in oil prices if Saudis can't turn production back on quickly, which could eventually mean higher gasoline prices here at home. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also says the United States will work with its allies to ensure Iran is held accountable for its aggression. Meanwhile, a source tells ABC News Saudi Arabia is threatening to raise oil prices because they're having a difficult time trying to stop those drone attacks. Wit. A lot of questions here. Stephanie Ramos at the White House, thank you. We want to bring in ABC News contributor Steve Ganyard, a former Marine Corps fighter pilot who also served in the State Department. Steve, thanks so much for joining us on this important story. 
Secretary of State Mike Pompeo pointed the finger directly at Iran. Given that tensions were already escalating between the two countries, with the U.S. launching a maximum pressure campaign against Iran and the absence of a nuclear deal, give us some context on the significance of these attacks. Yeah, what, uh, what, what a difference a few days makes. Uh, just uh, last uh, week, uh, late in the week, the administration was signaling that they were willing to consider releasing some of the pressure that the sanctions have placed on the Iranian economy. They've talked, they talked about maybe meeting with the Iranians at the U.N. later this month. Well, that's all gone and probably gone for a long time. So this is a very big escalation by the Iranians. They'd attacked things like oil pipelines, but this is oil infrastructure. And as Stephanie said, taking 5 percent of the oil world's oil supply off the market is a very big escalatory step. And inside Saudi Arabia, let's talk about the drones that were used here. They seem to be getting more sophisticated and effective. What does this attack say about the drones' capabilities and the threat they pose? The, the interesting thing uh, is that this is an asymmetric response. So these are ten, twenty thousand dollar drones that are defeating uh, air defense systems that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's a very cheap, very effective way. We see that the result of what twenty drones could do, but it's a very difficult thing to attack. Even now, the U.S. military is just rolling out the capability to take down these drones, and they'll do things like uh, go after their guidance system. They'll uh, use lasers to shoot them out. Of the sky or they'll actually have other hunter drones that will knock these drones down but it's a very difficult asymmetric threat that nobody in the world really has come to grips with yet now president trump says that the u.s supports saudi arabia's right to protect itself but what steps could the u.s take from here and how likely is it we could see a military strike as a response a lot of questions. Would I don't think we'll see a military response right off the bat. Uh, maybe at some point the uh, the administration will feel that they need to push back against the Iranians. But uh, when the oil market uh, oil markets open tonight, uh, they're going to be roiled. We may see something around a ten dollar increase per, in the uh, price of uh, a barrel of oil. But uh, I think what we have here is something where the administration is going to want to calm the waters, make sure that the global economy doesn't get roiled by this event. Uh, but it will be the first time that we see what is the new Trump administration's uh, approach to the rest of the world without John Bolton. Absolutely. Steve Ganyard, we appreciate your analysis this morning. Thank you. Dan? Stephen Witt, thank you very much. Let's bring in our chief anchor, George Stephanopoulos. Uh, George, you heard uh, Steve reference John Bolton, the outgoing uh, national security advisor, was quite hawkish. A lot of people see this story and think, though, are we headed inevitably, inexorably toward war with Iran? Well, that is a question. Could it escalate out of control? And to pick up on where Steve left off, this, this idea of easing sanctions on Iran to get the meeting with President Rouhani at the UN General Assembly next week was probably one of the final clashes between the president and John Bolton, who was very much against any kind of easing sanctions. The president seemed to indicate he wanted that meeting. As Steve said, that's off the table right now. What some of the president's allies, though, including Lindsey Graham, uh, the senator from South Carolina, are putting on the table, they say that an attack on Iran's oil refinery should be on the table right now. Whenever you're having talk like this uh, and, and tensions like this rising in that area, there is always a chance it could spin out of control, lead to a military conflict. But I agree with Steve. Right now, not likely. Worth noting the last time we were close to launching a retaliatory attack on Iran, the president pulled back at the last minute. Let's uh, take a step closer to home, though. We're just a few days away from the Democratic uh, uh, debate among the presidential candidates, expertly co-moderated by George Thank Stephanopoulos. Uh, let's talk about about where we are after having had a minute to digest it. Do you think Thursday night changed the state of the race at all? I don't think it changed a lot, but of course that on its own is a change as you're getting this much closer to the votes in, in Iowa and New Hampshire coming up at the beginning uh, of the year. I think overall, if you look back, uh, Joe Biden had a strong first half uh, the debate petered out a bit uh, in the second, but probably he's some fears from some of his supporters. I think Elizabeth Warren, she's had a lot of momentum, particularly on the ground in Iowa, and nothing happened, I think, on Thursday night that would stop that momentum right now. I think all the people who are looking to break out uh, from the pack, uh, I think they all did pretty well, but but I didn't see, think you saw any kind of a breakout performance. So I think that idea that not much has changed in the immediate aftermath of the debate is probably right. But you also see that the, the continuing fault lines revealed in that debate uh, between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren who are calling for political revolutions, transformation. The, the moderates on the stage who think they may be going too far, better or work, put out a lot on guns with that call for mandatory buybacks. 
effects. Some Democrats concerned about that. So I think you see issues that are going to linger going forward, but an immediate political impact doesn't seem like a lot of change. George, thank you very much. Always great to see you on a Sunday morning. I want to remind everybody, George has a big show this morning. He's going to go one-on-one -on -one with two of the 2020 candidates, including Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Senator Amy Klobuchar, plus Senator Ted Cruz, the Republican, on the debate over gun control on Capitol Hill. That's all coming up on this week. George, thank you again. Thank you, guys. Over to you. Well, some unanswered questions at the White House this morning, where President Trump was set to have dinner with Otto Warmbier's parents last night. Warmbier was the Ohio college student who was allegedly tortured by the North Korean government for reportedly stealing a government poster. He was sent home in a vegetative state and later died. It was widely reported yesterday that Warmbier's parents were to have a private dinner with the president last night. As of earlier this morning, radio silence from the White House press office on how that dinner went or if it happened at all. Overseas now clashes erupting again in Hong Kong as tens of thousands of protesters defy a police ban <laughs> and take to the streets. Tear gas and Molotov cocktails flying through the air on the 15th straight weekend of protests. Demonstrators clashing with police in what is believed to be the fifth largest protest in the almost four month movement. Those protests keep coming. We're going to move, though, though, now closer to home. And a breaking story we're following overnight. Decks collapsing at a three-story home on the Jersey Shore. This happened to take place during the annual New Jersey Firemen's Convention. So first responders who wound up needing help themselves. ABC's Kaylee Hartung is right there in Wildwood, New Jersey, with the latest. Kaylee, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Dan. When you see these two decks stacked on top of each other, it is a wonder no one was killed. So the third story deck falling on the second story deck, sending them both crashing to the ground. You can now see the exposed frame of the house there, and you'll notice the roof, it's unsupported. Overnight, a terrifying scene in New Jersey. This multi-level deck collapsing, trapping several people underneath the rubble. EMS respond across the street from 233 East Baker for a structural collapse. Neighbors and witnesses quickly jumping into action. I could hear the people over there calling for help. And I told the dispatcher what happened, where I was, and they sent the people out. Emergency crews rushing to the complex, working to free those stuck under debris. East Baker, At least 21 people hospitalized, including three children. Branchville, New Jersey Fire Chief John Fratto was on the middle deck with several of his fellow firefighters and their family members, all visiting for a convention. The upper deck came down on top of us, which made us trapped. It was just a lot of uh, yelling and screaming going on. A four-month-old among the injured. A fireman heroically saving another young child, trapped on a portion of the deck left standing after the initial crash. He climbed up the rubble, grabbed her off the deck, and at that same time of him grabbing it, that half of the deck collapsed. Earlier this summer, nearly 100 people were injured when this deck collapsed in Maryland. And in 2016, more than a dozen were hurt after a deck suddenly gave out during a party in New York. One person here transported to a regional trauma center, but of the more than 20 others hospitalized, 11 have been treated and released, and that includes the three children. Eva? All right, Kaylee Hartung for us there in Wildwood, New Jersey. In Pennsylvania, two people are hospitalized after one of them fell from a Ferris wheel at the York Fair. Investigators are inspecting the giant wheel, which has remained closed since the incident, trying to figure out if a mechanical error or a human error caused the accident. One of the injured fell from the ride. It's unclear how the other person was hurt. Now to a tragedy on the high school football field, a community in shock and mourning after a player collapses and dies. ABC's Zachary Keish is here with more on that story for us. Zachary, good morning. With good morning to you as well. Just a tragic story. Alex Miller had a love for the game and by all accounts, a bright future. This morning, the superintendent says there was no history of health issues on or off the field as the community tries to make sense of his sudden death. <laughs> Fierce rivals on the field united by loss and grief this morning. The town of Spencer holding a massive vigil overnight for football standout Alex Miller. The senior football player at Roan County High School in West Virginia was pronounced dead after suddenly collapsing during a football game Friday night. According to the superintendent, the medical emergency happened during a break in the action. There was a call for help, the game was stopped, and Miller was taken to the hospital. It's a shock to them. Uh, they were there 
Uh, they were getting ready for the second quarter one moment, and the next moment uh, Alex was, was on the ground. The game was initially suspended and scheduled to continue on Saturday, but now officials say it has been postponed indefinitely. The tragedy hitting those who were closest to him the hardest, his friends and teammates decorating his high school parking spot to honor his memory. The community expressing overwhelming support on social media. Even Senator Joe Manchin tweeting he was deeply saddened to hear of the tragic passing. While the cause of the death remains unknown, the school superintendent says the community is in disbelief. We've had just an outpouring of support, though, from communities both within Rome County and, and all around the state. The superintendent there says when they do get back on the field, they'll certainly be ready to honor this young man who, uh, you know, obviously tragically passed away mm -hmm. playing a game that he loves. Huge loss for his family and, for, and for the community. Zachary, thank you very much. There was a fatal shooting on the Texas-Mexico border this weekend. It happened near the Brackettville Border Patrol Station Friday night. Agents from that station were stopping a vehicle when one of the occupants shot one of the agents. The gunfire was returned and the unidentified man with a gun inside the car, he was killed. The second person inside that car was taken into custody. And we should say the injuries sustained by the Border Patrol agent who was shot were not life-threatening. Let's do a little change here and check in with Rob Marciano with the weather and lots going on in hey, the weather department. Wanna, yeah, and, uh, we can talk about Umberto. We'll, we'll update that. Uh, but we also have some fires that broke out overnight uh, in the west. And Southern California, a, a little fire there in Riverside County, Juniper Flats, that area, the community, of a mandatory evacuation. Uh, just a 200-acre fire, but only 10% contained. And we also had a fire break out along a, a, one of the freeways uh, near in L.A. yesterday afternoon. Uh, but firefighters managing to get a hold of that, the uh, interstate temporarily, at least one side of it, uh, shut down. We do have weather alerts, fire weather alerts, I should say, for much of the uh, Sierra Nevadas, much of Nevada as uh, well, and in through Salt Lake City, Reno, I could see winds gusting to 60 miles an hour. This is a pretty potent storm system that's moving through the Pacific Northwest right now. Uh, record rainfall in Quileute, Washington. You see this front coming through with some rain for the Northwest, but dry weather for the rest of the West and gusty winds today and tomorrow, and those alerts do last through tomorrow. Reno could see winds gusting easily 30, 40, maybe even 60 uh, miles an hour there with dry weather. All right, Umberto, here we go, 175 miles to the east of Cape Canaveral. It will stay offshore. It will strengthen 60 mile an hour winds now. Category one, maybe category two by Tuesday, uh, Wednesday uh, morning, and then getting toward Bermuda. We'll be watching that rip currents and rough surf if you're going to the beach across the southeast today. That's checking what's happening nationally weather-wise. Time now for a look at your local forecast. I'm ABC 7 Steve Rudin moving through the early morning hours a little bit on the cool side, but still very comfortable. We stand at 73 degrees and Reagan National cooler off to the west upper 50s in Winchester 55 in Petersburg. We do have added clouds out there right now, but those clouds will begin to break apart mid morning. We do stay dry going out for a cup of co cup of coffee temperatures that are in the middle 70s by 10 o'clock. Don't forget the Redskins game this afternoon daytime highs around 85 degrees. We will update you on some summertime heat in the next half an hour. For this next story, I'm going to have a seat. <laughs> what do you have for us? Sweet time yes. getting in there. Wow. Glad you're comfortable, Rob. I yeah. uh, hate to cut you off, but we've got an important and urgent story to get to. <laughs> a commode caper in England. This 18-carat mm. golden toilet, mm. it was on display at an exhibit at Winston Churchill's birthplace west of London. It was ripped from the wall this weekend and has vanished. An unidentified 66-year-old man has been placed under arrest. The toilet is said to be worth millions of dollars and is nowhere to be found. So all that money, the value, now down the toilet, so to speak. Oh, but, um, the royal you know throne. You know what's amazing? That was a functional toilet. You just have really? to wonder but if anybody someone... out there used it. But ever. how do you get away with a toilet? That's yeah, a and, and a, a really heavy toilet. shiny one like that. Yeah. Not just like a plain silver one. <laughs> <laughs> sort of I'm stands a, out. I have nothing to say on this story. You had a lot to say, yeah, right? No, I did. I did in your mind. <laughs> My comments were all off camera. Yeah. So many temptations. Uh, on a less bizarre note this morning, we're going to turn now to the doorbell cam video we're talking about at the top of the show. It shows a young boy saluting, and Janae Norman is here with more on this, on why this scene was especially poignant. Good this morning. is a really sweet story, a lot cleaner than the last one. When the boy's parents installed that doorbell camera, like so many others, it was for safety purposes. They never imagined that they would catch a moment quite like this one. Hi, Jesus. Tweet us back. I'll see you tonight. 
take us a milk. Meet Preston Sodderthway, the adorable five-year-old who is warming the hearts of Americans everywhere. It was an ordinary day. Preston had just finished a bike ride with his dad when suddenly he ran around to the front of his house. I was taking his bike into the garage and I thought he was falling behind me and 